Hi, I'm Joe Lawson of Lawson Digital Arts. Hi, I'm Dan Peters, the creator of Super Race and also known as Uncle Dan. And welcome to the commentary track to give you a little bit of an idea of what went into the making of Super Race and where it came from and how it was created. And it's kind of a unique program in that Dan basically did this 100% on his own. Yeah, I had an idea to try and do it on a computer in my living room, and this is what I came up with. Now, way back when, Kelly and I had had an idea to do a series of educational videos that taught kids, because we have two of our own, uh, how to do numbers, letters, colors, but it was more of a generalized idea, and Dan heard this idea and basically took the ball and ran with it in a very impressive way. I asked permission. It's like, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to take a crack at doing one of these myself. And uh, they generously said yes and invited me along on the venture and just decided that I would try and use a couple of things that I had handy and see what I came up with to start with. And the cars in town was the first thing that I did just to kind of do a proof of concept. And Joe and Kelly were really pleased with it and said, man, make more. I remember when we first watched it being very impressed by just the ideas that were put into it and uh, seeing it come together piece by piece. This wasn't really a standard sort of an animation production pipeline. No, it definitely wasn't. It was a lot more freeform rather than doing storyboards or even a script. I just decided I'm going to do things that I think would be fun to watch. It was also kind of incremental because I remember, for instance, these numbers, when you first did them, there wasn't an airplane in the sky flying up above, and I'm not even sure that the street idea was in there. I think that came later? Definitely. It was uh, another thing that just came along as I was doing the shots and thought, yeah, this would be kind of fun to do. And I remember the first iteration, I only counted up to 10, and Joe and Kelly thought, well, how about counting higher than just 10? And I thought, well, sure, we'll give it a try and see how it plays. One of the interesting things about the series, and, and this was a decision right from the very beginning, is that we do multiple languages. For instance, the Desert of Letters here had the signs all in English, French, and Spanish. Yeah, it was definitely right from the get-go we wanted to have multilingual because it's more important to teach that there's not just, you know, the United States in the world, that there's a lot of cultures out there and wanted to, to represent that in the teaching as well as the, the show. And Dan, one of your strengths that, that I would note in watching this is that you set up your visuals and then you keep the camera moving almost all the time. And usually in CG, that's kind of a, of, a, of an annoyance, but in this particular case, it works very well to continue the excitement factor. Well, thank you. I tried to keep the camera moving, but I tried not to draw attention to the fact. I wanted to keep it exciting, like you say, and I'm pleased that it worked as well as it has. I have never felt most of the time when we're watching this like we're dealing with a CG camera. Thank you. I definitely try to keep it within, within the boundaries of what somebody shooting a real movie would have done so that it feels like we're watching something happen as opposed to we're flying through this fake world. Love the tumbleweeds. <laughs> it was just a <laughs> random idea to spice it up a little. Now, again, one of the interesting things about this is that we tried to to put the, you put the shapes in very interesting situations throughout the entire piece. Well, it was an interesting challenge to come up with something that wasn't just going to be, here's a shape standing next to the side of the road. What software did you use for this? This was all rendered and animated in Lightwave 3D. Okay. And what would you say would be the normal process of putting together one of these shots? I would just make an animation version first where it was moving the models as though it was uh, moving toys around, setting keyframes, and test the animation in what they call wireframe mode just to make sure that the animation played out pretty cool. And if I liked what I did, then I'd uh, set it into a render queue and it would draw the pictures for me while I was off doing my day job. Now, when you first started this process, for the longest time, this tunnel was where everything ended. And I remember our kids had first watched it. They watched the first iteration of Super Race, and they wanted to watch it over and over again, up to the end of this tunnel. And then when you brought in part two, where we actually went into this area, 
They were so amazed that they wanted to watch it over and over again and again. <laughs> That's awesome. It was it was just the, the building process. That's right. It did last for uh, up to the tunnel for the longest time. And then suddenly I had more animation. And just kept coming up with things to, uh, to make the show longer and more interesting. And came up with the, the Canyon of the Mists to represent the colors first. And every time that I would learn something new that I could do in Lightwave, I'd find a way to incorporate it into this show. So one of the things that will be coming up is the waterfalls, and that was just making use of something that I had learned. And this was uh, the mists that we're watching now are a, a fog shader that's in light wave that I thought would be pretty cool to use and fun to drive the vehicles through. And so that's what led to this one. Now, typically in an animation production, you have a team of anywhere up from 10 to 15 people working for six weeks on a production of this this quality. You did this yourself, but it did take a lot longer. Yeah, that's definitely the case where you get to, to choose between spending quite a bit of money and having a big team, or if you don't have the money but you have the time, to just plug away at it yourself. And overall, the actual animation and render of this took about a year, and then it took about another six months to do all of the audio and the music and the whatnot at the end. Now, people are going to be watching and listening to this, and they're going to think, oh, well, you must have a high-powered computer system and a render farm and things that are way, way outside of my capabilities to do. One might think that, and I'd be very pleased to, <laughs> to point out that this was actually done on a 1.2 gigahertz Athlon computer, which nowadays is really, really small, and uh, only had 768 megs of RAM, and even though the machine wasn't speedy, it just kept churning away 24 hours a day, day and night, weekends, whatever. And whenever I had time away from work, I would do animation, I'd stockpile all of these things to render, and the machine would do it while I was at home. Now, as in all things, no matter what, it did require dedication. It did, and unfortunately it also required a handful of do-overs because I would do something, I'd finish it out to this quality, and then I would decide, eh, that could have been a little better. Now the fun thing is, is that you toss in really, really enjoyable elements throughout this piece, and we tried to keep you, you, you watching it. I get the sense that you were trying to keep it surprising, engaging, and new with every new environment. My hope was that there would be something that you would spot the next time you watched it, and the next time you watched it, something you hadn't seen before. Now, again, one of the things that that comes in handy is that there are available model libraries out in the world that we were able to pick common elements from? Absolutely. There were a handful of libraries that I'd purchased from the internet and rather than build everything myself, I would either use that as a starting spot and in a couple instances just use what I'd purchased. Now, I bring that up only to say to people that there's a lot of folks that say, oh, well, yeah, you can do this because you're an animator and you have lots of stuff right The dinosaur is a good example. I bought that in a set of a half a dozen dinosaurs and just animated that one almost out of the box. Now, another thing that is happening here is that we're seeing things repeated as far as numbers and letters and colors and whatnot. Uh, repetition is important for any educational process. It's something I remembered from TV shows that I watched growing up as a child. They would definitely show the same things over and over, and it helps you remember it because you did see the same thing. You start to memorize it because it's a familiar thing then. What was the most enjoyable part of this process for you? I actually enjoyed every bit of it, but I have to say that the most enjoyable part is to see the looks on children's faces when they're watching it, especially for the first time, and to see something new. The cows are a great example. We're looking at the cows now that as soon as that camera whipped around and showed the cow for the first time, they're like, oh my goodness. The dinosaur always gets a big response. A handful of things are a very, uh, very big response from the viewers the first time through. Now, we'll apologize to you in, in advance if you're listening to this commentary before you watch the show. I recommend turning it off now, going back and watching the show because we don't want to give away any of the surprises. Once you've seen it, then it's fun to come back. 
Uh, for instance, one of the most enjoyable laugh out loud things that I saw when I was watching this was the pyramid of cows. Number 20, you've got 20 cows, you gotta fit them into a screen. It's difficult to make them fit in a line when the television isn't wide enough and I had to pull the camera back a long way. So I decided I'm going to stack these cows as though they were cheerleaders. And that's how you get 20 cows on one screen. Kind of have a, a cow thing going in most of your work. I'm a farm boy at heart. So I decided I'd throw some cows into it as well. Now, if a person had this idea at home that they wanted to create something similar, would they be able to do it at home, do you believe? I think that it's possible as long as you've got the time, the inclination, and the, a couple of the tools, it should be doable, yes. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's done in here is very cinematic in terms of setup, uh, the camera moves and whatnot. You spent a lot of time studying movies in order to get this sensibility. I've definitely watched a few movies in my time and I like to believe that I'm a, a film student, although I haven't actually gone to film school per se, I have gone to a comic book and animation school, and I think that did come in handy, yes. Now, I'm gonna bring this up because coming up is a prime example of reusing things in your animation process uh, for different effects. For instance, these airplanes flying, some of these shots are actually reuses of the same shot. Oh, absolutely, if you have the shot, in fact, what I did for the cars going over the bridge is I set up the entire animation of the cars going across the bridge from start to finish, and then I would use segments of that animation setup, little snips at a time for each of these shots. <laughs> Thank you. And so I didn't have to animate the cars every single time. I just set them up one time, and I would reuse the segment of them crossing the bridge that I needed for each individual shot. Now, lest anybody think that we're cheating because we're low-budget filmmakers, this is something that happens in Hollywood productions at almost every step of the way, unless you have a money hose that you can throw at it. If you're smart about it, that's the way you try and do it, yeah. Rather than duplicate effort, you want to set it up and use it as effectively as possible. Now, there are a lot of different environments in this production, and we're getting into one of the more unique environments here, uh, where you started to use a little bit more complicated animation process uh, in order to get the fields. What did you do? The fields are actually a derivative from a fur shader, which is there's a plugin for Lightwave called Sasquatch, and that renders fur on, in case, creatures or whatnot. In my case, I used really long fur and colored it different colors and made it look like fields of grass or wheat. Now, at the time of this production, that is actually the basic program is included in Lightwave. That's correct. They have the, uh, the simple version or the, the, the test version that comes with Lightwave, is the Sasquatch Lite. And it, it's, it's a good bet that many animation programs out there will also have the same kind of functionality at some level. I just uh, Not just shilling for Lightwave here if we happen to use it, but most animation programs will let people do this. These days, almost all software have a first shader that they have available, yes. Again, I want to keep coming back to the idea that this is something that any person with, an, with a certain amount of vision can accomplish. Absolutely true. Now, the train was something that my son in particular just went gaga over when he saw that. I think that was a big surprise for him to see the train. Definitely inspired by your son to start with, but as I talked with other children, trains seem to be a really big theme with youngsters, and so I decided I just got to sneak one in here. Part of the process of this production is that in the kid-tested vein, it was very interactive. Uh, I remember our kids would actually gently request things to see. Definitely. You'd listen to what it was that they were looking at, what they were looking for, and uh, the things that really caught their attention and the things that really were just kind of by the wayside. And what I found interesting, too, is sometimes stuff that didn't catch their attention right away did eventually become the, the, the four because they'd seen the other thing enough times that they started looking at the rest of the image. Now, uh, the water here is very fascinating, and uh, to give credit where credit is due, uh, animators tend to share a lot of things when they're in the, the realm that we're in. Uh, 
they share techniques, they share surfaces. A lot of stuff is available on the internet and sometimes you run across a person who has made something that already exists that they'll share. Absolutely. I got to give big props to a friend of mine that's named Brad Hayes. He had done this water for a project that I'd worked with him on and I decided that it was a really good basis for you know any water and asked for permission to, to copy down these settings and he said yeah use it it's something that's just going to help a lot in the, in the long run so run with it thanks to Brad uh, it wasn't that terribly long ago that if somebody had said let's put some water in a low budget project everybody would go Eek! it's not gonna happen but nowadays again because technology has advanced even so much since when you first started Super Race uh, again it's a doable at home also, I chose water in a way that it wasn't going to be extra difficult for me to do. Doing a boat, throwing up a little bit of foam was a lot simpler than if I'd had things falling in and splashing. So I chose my battles as well as the fact that we have better technology. I think that's a good point to keep in mind because as a low budget filmmaker, you have to be smarter, work smarter in almost every realm. And sometimes that involves of uh, cutting your darlings or changing your tack in order to achieve your goals. Absolutely. You don't want to set off to do something like armies of hundreds of thousands of things running across a plane if you can't afford to do that either in time or budget or scale of equipment. It's the kind of thing where you choose your battles and you make things that you can make as best as you can make them. Now, I'm going to only bring this up because technical people will appreciate it. This is the one shot in the entire piece that is not done using 24 frames per second film technique. That's correct. I had to do this one at 30 frames per second interlaced to make all of the things on the side of the train read really super clear. Anything less than that and it started getting very muddy. So there are still accommodations that you have to make. Just so you know, in, in the realm of saving yourself time and effort, every single frame requires time to render. And so you look for ways to reduce the number of frames that you, you have to do. Video takes 30 frames per second. Film is 24 frames per second. But there are tools and techniques that can expand that 24 frames to 30 frames. So animators routinely at studios will save themselves that extra six frame of rendering. Just to give people an idea of how much time that really does save, what was a rough average of frames or the amount of time per frame on a show like this? I tried to keep my average frame render down to five minutes a frame, but there were some shots that were 15 and 20 minutes to draw one frame on the, on the computer. But in terms of a per second savings, and by the way, I love this music cue. I think it's one of the best changes. I'd like to come back to the music in a moment. Um, but on an average shot, that would be about 20 minutes worth of savings per second. Absolutely right. You got to cut as many times as possible because there's an awful lot of seconds in a half an hour. Okay, homegrown. Let's talk about the music and the sound effects a little bit. Not really much in the way of sound effects, but definitely music. What did you use? Well, Joe actually introduced me to a software called Acid, and it, it allows you to take little snips of music, arrange them on a timeline, mix them together, and suddenly you have created a song. And I'm not terribly musically inclined, although I feel like I have the music in my head. This was a really awesome tool to allow me to express that, and this particular version of Acid allowed me to put a little small version of the picture in the bottom corner of the software so I could actually make the music cue to things that were on screen. And writing the music for this was one of the best joys of it. Okay, again, off-the-shelf tools. We're not using anything that a person at home couldn't reasonably expect to put on a credit card or, or save up a little bit of money. I prefer save it, please, and then buy it. Uh, a person at home can do this. Absolutely. This was off-the-shelf software. I didn't have a bank of programmers that were answering questions that I needed done. This was stuff that was relatively simple to learn and uh, made the process really doable for me. Speaking of learning, again, in terms of resources available, the fish swarms, the, the schools of fish here, there was an internet tutorial. Another lesson learned, there was a tutorial, in this case, on a Lightwave website 
where they taught how to do flocks of birds, like the flocks of birds that were flying over the fields earlier. And I repurposed it, and suddenly I had flocks of fish. I remember when when we were about ready to move on to the next phase of this production, you were so proud of what was coming up. You knew we were going to like it, and I was. I, it just floored me when I saw the concept of the next round of shapes. I couldn't really figure out how to put shapes underwater, so I just decided I'm going to have some sunken ruins that are interesting to look at and have some bubbles foaming off of it and hopefully that'll be interesting and gotta say the giant manta ray was my brother's idea roger thank you for suggesting this i'm really pleased with the way it came out now the one thing i will also go into is that there's another bit of software that might be a little bit more expensive but if you're looking to do this kind of a production is definitely worth the investment and that is editing software Definitely. When you're putting together more than just a couple of shots, you want a piece of software for for editing that's more than usually you're going to have. Something that's not just like the $100 one that you're normally going to see. I invested in a a software called Vegas Video. It's also from the same company that does the uh, Acid Music software I'd mentioned earlier. It made this process really really straightforward and I'm so pleased that I got that software. Now, speaking for myself as an editor I know that that a lot of the consumer level software is pretty good and there's a lot that you can do with it but most of the time it doesn't have the kind of control over shot layers or multiple sound layers or the kinds of things that you need to do when you're doing a professional program. Is it worth investing a bit more in order to make that part of it work? If you're going to be editing home videos, that'll be more than sufficient just having the lower key stuff. If you're going to be doing something that's, you know, a a half an hour long, you're probably going to want to step up and get something that's more professional, yes. Now, originally this was produced for VHS, and so one of the things that you might think is, well, you don't need to have that much quality to do a VHS videotape, but when it comes to the computer realm, you still have to anticipate and the quality level is going to be up there. I definitely tried to to think forward and do this strong enough that yeah there could be a DVD release in the future. Hopefully it's holding up real well. The turtle. (laughs) We've got to talk about the turtle because this was another stop point for the longest time. I just decided that it would be another moment to have another animal and I like the idea of having him Look like he's in jeopardy, but he's uh, he's in the right spot at the right time. This was a smart turtle. He was crossing the road at the wrong moment, but at the right spot. Ah, but can we not also say that Robert Rodriguez rules? <laughs> definitely a small El Mariachi tribute there, definitely. All right, low-budget filmmaking, rock on. This also was kind of cool. I, I've got to admit, the Easter Island heads was a definite surprise, and I just loved it when I first saw it. Again, you got... Uh, you got to fill something new, you got to have uh, an interesting thing to look at, and I like the idea of having a physical number of something to count along with the numbers, sort of like the cattle, but I thought, I've already done a desert, I want to do something similar, I know, I'll have big stone figures. That'll be the uh, same but different. One of the things that you'll note here is that the lighting is very consistent from environment to environment, and there's a lot of drama in that. What goes into your philosophy of color and light? Well, in this instance, I was attempting to represent the whole course of a day. This is meant to be getting later in the evening. The shadows are starting to get longer. But uh, overall, I just wanted to make this bright and colorful and happy environments that were pretty to look at and nicely saturated colors. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, we have come to the point where we're actually doing the final repetition of all three of the languages. And may I give props to my lovely bride, Kelly, for doing the voiceover on this. Um, but again, this was all done using one recording device, the very same camcorder, actually, that we're using right now to record this commentary track. Yep, just had Kelly do some uh, voice work for us. Joe directed her for me. and. Uh... We just took that audio into the computer and cut it up, 
edited it to where we needed it. And this is the result. It works out really, really nicely. It was a relatively simple thing to do. And now that we have the voice work, we can use it for hopefully future projects as well. So again, we're back to the idea that all of this was done in an environment of our homes. There wasn't anything that we went out of, out of network to go produce. We didn't go get somebody else involved. We didn't talk to a studio and say, hey, can we borrow render power? None of that. We didn't need to go to a sound studio. We didn't have to rent studio space or time. These were just things that we chose to do when we had the opportunity and with the equipment that we had or could borrow. Now, I think this is the most lyrical and beautiful part of the entire production, but it was also the most heinously expensive. It was definitely a pretty big render hit. I had first thought I wanted to have the cars driving through snow, just because I liked the idea of having all of this airborne stuff and the camera parallaxing through it. But I couldn't figure out a smart way to put snow in the shots, so I went with trees shedding different colored leaves. There are approximately 70,000 leaves in each of these shots, and that took the computer just, I think it was about seven minutes to load the shot, and then each frame was about a half an hour to render. Now, again, you use time wisely in that when you knew you weren't going to be home for an extended period of time, or when, during the eight hours that you were at work, or over a weekend, let's say, if you went away somewhere, you just planned ahead. Absolutely. I had an, uh, an option to tell the computer, this is a list of shots that I want you to load and render for me, and it would just chew through them until I stopped it or until it ran out of things to do. What was the most difficult part of the production overall for you? The most difficult part was very probably coming up with the next thing. I kept I kept topping myself and I kept challenging myself to think of something new and exciting and I kept wanting to keep it interesting and unique and once in a while I felt like I didn't quite accomplish that but overall I'm pleased with the result. Well and uh, that segues very naturally into this next segment which ties into the fact that I think Joey mentioned or was starting to get interested in construction equipment about this point. So I went online, found a place where I could buy a crane model, and decided I'm just going to have the cars hoisted for no actual practical reason, but it sure made it for a pretty shot. And this was one of my favorite shots in the film, to see this very wide vista of an area. And uh, I think it worked out pretty nicely. Now again, in the creative solutions area, another way to make the shapes look more interesting uh, was to use something that we could do in 3D, and that's this parallax that allows you to form the shades. I would set the camera up in the last position where I knew I was going to have it looking at the shape, and I would build the shape so that it looked correct from that angle, but then when the camera is coming up on it, it just looks like a bunch of random dots. And this was based on something that I had seen as a child and just wowed the socks off of me. I couldn't believe that disparate objects could form into something that you really recognize easily and I'm very pleased with the way that this looks on camera. Now as we come towards the end of the show here, are there any other things that you'd like to pass on about the production of Super Race to would-be filmmakers or just people that would like to know more about the production? Well, we've covered a lot in the fact that if you want to try and do this at home, I definitely recommend that you do try it. It is something that can be done. It's not as simple as just making a small home video, but it is not as difficult as the Hollywood producers would want you to think. It's something that can be accomplished with a little bit of perseverance and uh, persistence. And uh, I think you'll find that you have a lot more fun doing it than you get worried about doing it. As we come to the end of this production, we, we had we had some thoughts about how it should end, and one of the ideas was possibly to have three different sets of tapes out there with three different endings, but then we came back to the core philosophy of this being a non-competitive exercise. That was definitely my favorite idea, that the actual race was not about winning a, a race, but learning, and that the winning comes from what you learn. And uh, what would be more fun than having fireworks at the end of your production? 
fireworks are very, very big, even for us older little kids. So that had to be the way to go. Now, again, we come back around here towards the end, and the idea is that we're going to slow things down. We're done with our story. It's time for the kids to go to bed. That was definitely the philosophy here. I thought I, thought I would have the cars gently go back into their, their starting place, and I have the lights turning off and the doors closing almost as though the cars are going to sleep. It's meant to be very full circle. They've, they've come back to where they started. And hopefully, when you watch the movie a second or third or many of time, it'll look like they just picked up where they left off. Now, of course, we're going to look at the sky, and what do we end on? You've got to have the shooting star, a little uh, homage to Steven Spielberg, who always manages to sneak one in. Now, here's something that, again, we was a nice surprise at the very end, and that is the bloopers. <laughs> uh, inevitably, as you're going through making the original production, you come up with these little wacky thoughts. It's like, this would be fun to do, but there's no way to fit it in. And I went ahead and made them and, and snuck them into the end titles, and I'm pleased that uh, Joe said, yeah, go with it. Okay, so uh, here we are at the end of Super Race, and I know that this whole segment always gets great laughs for my kids. Thanks very much. I really appreciate you guys listening. And if you got the idea to go make something, go do it. And uh, we've got more productions coming up from Lawson Digital Arts. Hopefully you'll pick those up and enjoy them just as much as you did Super Race, our first inaugural production. There's our core team of reviewers. Yay, Joey, Michaela, Alan, Michael, and Andrew. And uh, in final words. Thanks for listening and uh, see you at the movies. All right. Thank you for listening. I'm Joe Lawson. I'm Dan Peters, or Uncle Dan. And uh, thank you for watching Super Race. Take care.